Um, I'm Bonnie hennig trestman known in the HD community as Dr. Bonnie. I've introduced myself to many of you. Um, I have been working with people who have Huntington's disease and their families and caregivers and professionals for about 26 years. So this is a talk called Talking to Kids About HD, and I hope that it will be helpful for some of you. I will try to leave some time at the end for discussions, and I will be here tomorrow as well if you want to just grab me and ask some questions. Just don't grab me, just ask me. <laughs> that was supposed to do something. There we go, okay. So here's our topics of discussion. We're going to understand the reasons for talking to kids, know the who, when, how, and what about talking to kids about HD, learn a little bit about kids' emotions, and learn approaches of sharing information. So let's talk about the reasons, very simply. A child has a right to know about anything that affects the family. By not talking about HD, Children learn not to trust. And I can tell you that, as I just said, that I've been in this community for 26 years. I am now on my third generation of people, and those children that I work with who were six and seven many, many years ago are adults. So this is not just something that I came up with. This is the feedback that I'm getting from adults uh, as well. Children also know that there's something wrong in a household if there is a lot of hushed if there's a lot of crying, if there's a lot of screaming, if there's not a lot of answers to questions, then they know that there is something wrong. They can identify it. But by not saying anything, a lot of times they have fears that are worse than actually what is happening. So what could be worse than HD? They're thinking that they've done something that might cause somebody to be sick. In turn, they a lot of times do develop anxiety and guilt. And by not talking about Huntington's disease gives the message that it is a subject too terrible to discuss. Remember that fears are learned, and we'll talk a little bit about this in, in a few slides. Okay, more reasons. Children might find out the truth from others anyway, especially in a time now of being online and social media and different people connecting with each other. There might be a cousin, there might be an aunt, there might be somebody in the family who puts something about Huntington's disease on their Instagram, on their Facebook, and all of a sudden they're finding out about this from somebody else. Come on in. Oh, no, okay, don't no, come in. Um, children who are informed can be a comfort to you. You're not going to feel that you have to spend more energy in remembering what you had told them. Lying takes a lot of energy. You're trying to think, what did I tell that child? What do they know? What do they not know? By telling the truth, and again, we're going to talk about it's not regurgitating everything to them, but by telling the truth, all of a sudden children learn to be a support to you as well. And do know that children have an amazing ability and a capacity to deal with difficult situations. So I just said that fears are learned. Think about the studies that are done on children, you know, when there is a, um, a, a, a clinician and there's a fake you know, spider or a snake and the mother or father or the caregiver doesn't react. You know, it's like, oh, there's a snake versus the mom is like, oh my God, there's a snake, there's a spider, oh my God. And the child goes, oh, when we see something like that, we start to scream. Think about that the same way in terms of Huntington's disease. If you make this normal and you say, this is Huntington's disease, that's very, very different because the child will not learn to fear this. And if the person with HD shows behaviors which now have an explanation, children will learn that this is normal and continue to show affection and respect towards that person and not be afraid of them. So, and again, this is, a, as I said before, and they ask the experts, this is just a smorgasbord. This is just tapas. This is not, you know, I'm going to go over things to, to give you the ability to have tools in your toolbox to be able to do this. So I will, even though I'm going to try to slow down, this is going to be something that's just a little smattering for you. So ask questions later. Who should tell the kids? I always tell people, if you are the primary caregiver, if you are the person with HD, if you are able to, it really can be helpful for you to be that person to talk to the child. Now, I understand in every situation that, that, that that's not perfect. That's not going to happen. So the second best would be a close family member. However, the caveat is make sure that person has the correct information. 
I know as a parent, as somebody who has been in this community working with people who have HD and their family members, that what we want to do as parents is protect our children. I get that. I understand. But when you have a child that has been told and it's been all sugar-coated and candy-coated and things have been left out that are important, that's not really protecting our children. It's protecting us. That's our knee-jerk reaction that we don't want anything bad to happen, but that doesn't change the situation. The third is if it, all of these things you know, aren't uh, exactly perfect, a professional staff who works in the HD community. Again, if you have somebody that the child trusts, it's wonderful. If you're going into a professional, please make sure that they are actually somebody who knows how to talk to children about Huntington's disease and knows about Huntington's disease. Because if they're going to give misinformation, that's not going to be helpful. But I do tell people that it's really important when they bring children in to talk to me that you give them something. I don't think I look too intimidating or scary to many of you, although some people say I am, okay. When a child comes into a building that they don't understand, that they don't know where they're going, they're afraid they're going to get a shot, they're afraid something's going to happen, they're afraid I'm going to tell them this awful news. If you at least are able to say Huntington's disease, that we're going to talk to the, the, the healthcare people that mommy or daddy or auntie or you know, granny comes to talk to, that I'm going to introduce you to them. A lot of times now because of COVID and a silver lining is I can meet children and families online first. And then they can say, oh, you're going to go in to see Dr. Bonnie. And then I get on the floor and we draw pictures and we play with Play-Doh and we talk about Huntington's disease. But at least I have a connection now with that child so they know what to expect. When should I tell my children? At any and all ages. Inevitably, after I give, have given this talk for, I don't even know how many years or how many decades I've given this talk, I will have somebody who comes up to me who says, I didn't do it right. I, I didn't give my children the information. And I say, no, that's not true. You did the best job you could with the information you had at the time. Nothing wrong with that. Now you have new information. Now you can go back and say, I learned something that it's really important to talk to you about something. That's fine. You did not do anything wrong. You did the best job you could. I'm giving you a new tool in your toolbox. So what I say is any and all ages, Obviously, the younger that the child is, the more basic the information should be, and we'll talk about that. When they're adolescents, there's going to be time for more specific information, but the take-home message is it's never too early, but it's also never too late. That's the take-home message for you guys. How? First, please, please, please look at your own feelings about HD, meaning how was HD told to you in your family? Were you a family that kept very, very quiet? Were you a family who openly discussed this? Were feelings talked about? If you are somebody who has a bit of resentment, anger, guilt, all of these feelings, please talk to someone first to process that because that's going to come out. Even if we try to say it's not going to, that information and how we present it is going to come out into, to our children. So please work through that before you start talking to your children. Find a language that's also comfortable for you. Now, I had one family who said we were going to call it a boo-boo. Well, the child went to school, fell in the playground, and the nurse said, oh, you have a boo-boo on your leg, right? Very innocent. But it's like, oh my god, I have that boo-boo that daddy has in his head. OK, I understood why everyone was doing this. But if we say that there is you know, a brain disease, even if the child doesn't understand that completely, letting the child know that you can't catch this, that you're not going to be able to you know, touch somebody and get this. We can talk about genetics later on, but you please, it's kind of like when I talk to, to people about you know, teaching your children about sex. You can label things you know, with those funny different names that we all label our body parts, but I say to people, use the technical terms as well. You know, this boo-boo is special and it's called HD. Okay, it's a, a, it's a different kind of boo-boo, if that's the word that you want to use. So find language that's comfortable to you. You will probably, if you have especially a range of children in their ages, need to talk to children separately at different ages. However, and extremely important, at some point, stick everyone in the room and talk about Huntington's disease on a very, very basic level. So many times I get people to say to me, 
I've got one kid who's my warrior. I've got one kid who's in therapy or who's depressed. I've got one kid with special needs. So I didn't want to tell that child, but I told the other one or two or three. Again, you're trying to protect your children, but what you've done is, number one, is put a lot of burden onto those other children to say, you know, don't tell your sibling who worries. Now, what one or two things are going to happen from that. One, the child is going to hold on to that, and that's a lot of burden to ask of any child. Or they're going to tell the child, and they're going to tell the child not to tell you. Either way, it's not helpful. I know, again, that you're saying, I've got a child with special needs, or I've got a child who is a worrier, um, but I, you know, and I don't want to, to, do, to tell them. But if they are, chances are that you also have a team of support. There's going to be a therapist or a psychiatrist or somebody. Let that person also know um, that this is what's going on so that you have the support built in. It is much, much better to do that. Again, it's not that you did anything wrong, but I want you to think this through as well. Role play. Practice what you say and anticipate those tough questions. Are you going to die? Is granny going to die? Is my sister going to die? It's really important to think those through and not just say, I'm hoping that the child's not going to ask those questions. They are, and if they don't ask, they're thinking about these questions. Find a comfortable or familiar place to talk to your children. So if you're a family that does the dishes together or plays a puzzle or does a game or goes for a walk, that's a good place. I had one family who said, you know, this is going to be a really hard talk. And we talked about, you know, where they spend a lot of time with their children. And the mother says, you know, I drive them to, you know, the mall or to practice or something that's like a half an hour away. I said, perfect. You're sitting in the front seat looking forward. They're in the back. You don't have to do this eye-to-eye -eye contact, which is sometimes really difficult. If they're in the car, the doors are locked, they're a captive audience, start talking about, you know, I'm dropping you off but I'm going to be having a discussion with you. Um, we're going to be talking about something called Huntington's disease. And it did, only needed to be like a five or 10 minute conversation the first time. And that was her comfortable place to say, nobody had to look at e each other and we were able to have this conversation. What and how much? I'm going to break this down to tell in children information they can understand, listening to them, telling them how you feel, being aware of the don'ts, and some ways to talk to children. So. Gradually share bits of information. If you've ever been around a baby or a child, we are not introducing them to food by putting a steak in front of them, okay? I'm a vegetarian, I'm sort of a, sort of a vegetarian. All right, you are taking a tiny spoon and you're putting some mush on there and you're giving it to that baby and you're stepping back and going, what's gonna happen? And the baby makes his face and the baby maybe swallows it and the baby maybe spits it out. The baby maybe says, you know, I want more. That's how you, I want you to think about this. With a tiny little spoon, you don't have to do all of this at one time. You're not feeding the baby a steak. Leave them with a feeling of hope, no matter what. There are, you know, I went to this Congress, I talked to the doctors, there's so much hope. If you leave my office, no matter if you are somebody at risk, are a child, an adult, have symptoms, whatever it is, when you walk out of my office or off of the teletherapy that I do, I'm going to say something at the end that's going to leave you with a feeling of hope, whatever it is, whatever I can come up with, because I want you to know that there is hope out there, and it's true, and I'm not, I'm not lying to anybody, but I want you to end conversations on something that is hopeful. Tell children that they will always be loved and cared for, no matter what. If something happens to you, and think it through of what you do want to happen, but that they will always be loved and cared for because children are narcissistic. They're thinking about you, they don't want you to die, but they are thinking about that for them, what's going to happen to me. So know that this is really important to, to think about. Listen to them, answer questions simply. You don't have to go into CAG repeats, you don't have to go into a whole dissertation of this. If they answer, ask you a question, answer it. Ask them, tell me what you think HD is afterwards. Either, you know, did you Google this? Did you find out about Huntington's disease? What I say to people when I'm uh, doing genetic testing, one of the last questions I ask is, if I was an alien that came down from space and never heard of Huntington's disease, how would you explain it to me? So this is adults. And adults will give me information, and then I can correct the information. The same is true with children, correcting the things that are true. 
ask a child when, they, when you ask them, you know, do you have any questions, uh, are they worried about you or the family member? And they're going to say no. Most of the time they're going to say no because they want you to think that they are not worried. This is your opportunity to say, that's fine if you're not worried and if you're not, that, that, no, no problem. However, I want to let you know that sometimes I get worried or sometimes I worry about you or I worry about dad or I worry about granny. And it's really important to know that that's a common and very, you know, an emotion that we all have. But the good news is that we don't have to worry alone. We can worry together. We can't change the outcome, but if you're worried, I want you to come to me. You're not overburdening me. You're not going to make me sad. I'm sad sometimes anyway. But if we can be together and find out the answer of some of the questions or hug each other or talk about it, it'll be much better than if we don't talk about it. Look for nonverbal cues to see if the child has enough. I'll probably start seeing those nonverbal cues in you guys too in about 20 minutes when you're like, I'm, I'm tapped, I'm totally tapped. You know what that looks like in the children that are in your families. You're just, they're thinking about something else or looking, they're picking their toenails, you know, whatever it is, they're doing something different, right? So you know that that's a time to stop and tell them that you plan to continue this discussion at another time. It is a, a, an ongoing discussion. Beware the don'ts. Please, please, please don't lie to children. Don't tell them, no, you're never going to get this. Don't tell them that, you know, you're never going to put mom or dad in a nursing facility because you don't know what the future is going to be. Don't tell them that, you know, everything's going to be okay and they're not going to have this gene unless you know that they don't. You can certainly say, I don't know, we'll talk about that. Also, don't overburden them with a lot of medical detail. So I don't know if, if people were in some of the other sessions with me or talking to me. One of the last things I'll say to you, which is wrote now for me, is did that answer your question? Because you asked me a question. I think I understand what the question is. I've answered it, and you're going, she's off the mark. She has no idea. But if I say to you, did that answer your question, and you say, yes, it did, great. If I ask that question and you say, no, it didn't, I can say, ask me again in a different way. So it's really important to be able to, to um, uh, finish that. Don't trouble them with financial concerns unless it impacts their lifestyle. By this I mean that sometimes I work with families who went on elaborate vacations or you know, were involved in many sports and because of the financial constraints that they would sometimes, are the doors open? Come on in. Um, sometimes with the financial constraints, they were not able to do this. So if you say to the child, okay, we're going to go on one place or we're going to, you can pick one sport and this is the reason why and explain that to them. But they do tend to worry about um, things like, you know, how much money we have and what's going to happen that mom or dad is not working anymore. So don't try to trouble them with financial concerns. If you think a child is not listening, but they are in the house, they are listening. I'm telling you that right now. No matter what, I have so many people who say, and we do some, it's a totally separate subject, but we do some um, genetic counseling and testing and giving results on, online now, totally different, um, where I am in, in um, some of the states that I, I am licensed in. And they say so a lot of times, well, you know, the kids are in another room. No, 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 no. I want that if you haven't had a whole conversation, if you don't want your results then and there with your children in the, in the house, let's find a place for them to go that they're cared for, that you can act the way you need to and show the emotions. If you think your children are upstairs and they don't hear you, they do hear you. So I think that that's really important. Um, don't be afraid to say, I don't know. I don't know means two things. I don't know, but somebody else might know, so let's see if we can ask that person. I don't know means that that might be something that happens in the future, and we're just going to kind of have to hold each other and just wait in terms of the time and seeing in terms of what happens in the future. And please, 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 we talked a little bit about this at Ask the Experts. Somebody talked about not having, you know, not pushing children to who are at risk if they don't want to be involved. Don't push children to talk. So many times I get children who like kind of push through my door, door and it's like, here's the holy grail. Dr. Bonnie is going to fix everything. No, I'm not, right? I'm going to be able to talk to the child a little bit. But if that child doesn't want to talk, they're not going to talk. That doesn't mean you say, I'm never going to talk to you again. I'm going to give you another opportunity. But right now, you know, this child is not willing to open up for lots of reasons. Let's try to figure that out. And a tip is sometimes a child will say, you know, or the child will talk to other friends or, or people that don't know Huntington's disease. So here's my other tip to say, I gave you a lot of information. I know your friends are a support for you, but not a lot of people have HD. 
So if you do have questions and you don't want me in the room or to talk to me, that's fine. I can connect you, and now you have a whole support system here. I can connect you to people who you can talk to about this. So let's see if we can do that. Ways to say things, simply. And I know I'm really simplifying this, but I'm just giving you something concrete. Mom, dad has an illness. It's called Huntington's disease or HD. That's it. It's not about fear. It's just about very, something very concrete where you just start to open the door. This illness or disease makes mommy or daddy do some things that aren't normal all the time. Sometimes drawing a family tree can be really helpful to talk to kids about family members without HD, without having that first conversation about who in the family has this um, and, and thinking about the genetic ramifications. So that sometimes is really helpful to have that first conversation. Coping with the unknowns and uncertainties. There are un many unknowns and uncertainties in dealing with HD. I want you to become comfortable with that first. Where if we are in a place that we know that there's going to be a lot of things where that I don't know means nobody knows, that's okay. I want you to think about that and be comfortable. There are some questions you will not be able to answer. Accept this because that will help your children to accept this as well. And find out as much as you can to make the unknown more familiar. When you start to talk to your children, you're going to educate yourselves. They're going to ask questions as well. So this is a good time to be able to do that. And here's some tips to deal with some changes. Let children know gradually that there'll be change in the, what the person with HD is able to do. So for an example, in the United States, when people start thinking about um, become going on disability. There's a whole process with Social Security to be able to apply for monetary benefits. That takes a while to do and it doesn't, it takes six months for an application to be approved. So if a, if a person with HD is tested and they're tested positive, that doesn't mean that, you know, that then and there you say to the child and you know, mommy or daddy is not going to be able to drive or work or anything. But let's say it's that time to apply for disability. To be able to say, um, you know, now is a time that uh, we want to let you know that dad's going to start not working anymore. So you might see him around a little bit more. If you have any questions, let us know about it. So it starts to get the child a little familiar, but it also tries to keep the routine uh, the same, that maybe dad can help to get everyone out the door because it's early for him. So you do want to try to keep household routines as normal as possible without denying the illness. By this, I specifically mean the driving issue. That if mom or dad is starting on disability and you're not 100% sure that you want to put them, your children in a car with them, don't. If you're saying that you know, there's a time that is going to come that it's not going to feel safe for this person to drive your children around, think that through. That does, we don't want to say, well, I don't want to take away their independence. Okay, well, would you rather start thinking about that conversation or would you rather have your children in a car with somebody that you're not 100% thinking that driving around is good? Or would you have that person drive and be in a situation that they've hit a van full of a family that you know, is, is now, is now you know, dead or something like that? So don't deny the illness, but keep routines as, uh, as um, normal as possible. Ask for help. This is such a hard one, especially in our, in our society and community, whether it's here, whether it's in anywhere in the Middle East, in, in Africa, anywhere. It is so hard for us to ask for help. But I've worked with so many families over the years who have had such a hard time asking for help that a lot of times some of these families refuse to tell their children about HD, don't want to ask for help are denying this in a way because they think that this is the best way to protect their children, but it's not. Families I've worked with who all of a sudden, you know, had to go from not talking about Huntington's disease to one time I went to a town hall meeting where we basically were able to come to the town and say, this is an open meeting for anyone who is affiliated with this family. We want to start talking about Huntington's disease. So it was this 180 of being able to say this family needed help. They needed help of going to the store to getting a gallon of milk. They needed help bringing the children to some of the activities that the family was not able to do. And it was this outpouring of love. You don't have to go that far, but please, if people, people will say, you know, what can I do to help? And you say nothing. Or they'll say, um, call me if you need me to help. That's a hard one. But if you can think of something to do to say, Every Tuesday, my kid goes to ballet with you. Can you bring my child? You know, I'll write a note or something like that. That would be a huge help. 
When you go to the store next time, can you buy these four things that I'm always running out of? Something. When you uh, have people help you, you're actually giving them a gift. They want to be helpful. So if I say to you, hey, it would be really helpful for you when you're at the store to pick up these four things for me, I've given you a gift. You feel better. You feel better knowing that you, you can help me in some way. And it has taken a little bit of a burden off of me. You know, is, are you able to uh, watch my kid for 20 minutes, you know, once a week or something like that so I can just kind of have this little bit of time? It's not a weakness. It's actually something that can be really helpful for people. Be flexible when necessary. So the, the, when I wrote this, um, the example I gave was a family that would have a, a movie night. They would actually, you know, those times that we used to go to these places that show movies called movie theaters. Um, they would get together like once a month. Mom had Huntington's disease. They were each able to bring a friend and they were going to go to the movies. The children were talked to about Huntington's disease. The friends who were in this bubble with them all knew about Huntington's disease. And mom did have some of those behaviors that she would have tantrums or it would be very difficult. So this one, one month, they were all together and the mom had her tantrum. And the dad said, okay, we know what to do. We, we're flexible. We know that this is not our fault. This is Huntington's disease. We're not gonna even be mad at mom. I'm gonna get mom into her bedroom to have her calm down. I'm gonna to say to her, you know, we're all gonna be sitting on the couch. If you come down, you can come out, but we're gonna get popcorn, we're going to put on Netflix, we're gonna show two movies, and we're gonna create our own movie theater. Nobody's fault here. And we're not pissed at mom, and we're not gonna call her crazy, and we're not gonna say we hate you. We know that this is Huntington's disease that's flaring up. And now we're gonna be flexible, and we're still gonna have a good time. And then if mom comes out, that's fine. If she doesn't, it's fine. Have also an emergency plan. This one um, was, a, a, it's really a legacy because this gentleman has, has died many, many years ago, decades ago. Um, but this was a family <coughs> that I thought about who was invited to an event and it was in another state and they were gonna all get dressed up and they were gonna go and get their hair done and the girls were gonna get their nails done and the boys can get their nails done, I don't care. Um, and they were gonna have this really great time and they made this, um, uh, you know, they, they got the car, they, they said yes, we're all four of us are gonna go to this event. And then uh, she and I had a discussion. I said, what happens if at last minute he's not going to want to go. What happens if he starts having that tantrum? What's going to happen? She said, no, no, he's going to go. He's saying that now, but what's going to happen? She said, okay. So she wound up calling the neighbor and said, here's the date. Here's the save the date. Here's the date in three months. This is what's going on. If I need you, are you willing to come over and stay with my husband? He's like, absolutely. So everyone was getting excited. And we know that this sometimes happens with people with Huntington's disease because it's different. Right, so I have so many people, you know, we have this thing called Disney World in, in, in the United States. No judgment, if you love Disney World, no judgment. It is just like an arcade, it's as if you're living in an arcade, it's just overstimulation. And we have so many family members who say, we're gonna go on a cruise ship, or we're gonna go to Disney World, or what? It's, it's like 24 hours of being in a discotheque or something. And it's a lot for people who have Huntington's disease. So even though there's an event, and even though I think inside they really do wanna go, it's scary and it's different. And if they can have a fit, if they can throw a tantrum like a, a, you know, a toddler, then everyone's gonna stop what they're doing and, and kind of, you know, the, the behavior's going to change and everyone's gonna stay home. And that's kind of what happened with this gentleman. He really did want to go, but he was so, I think, scared that he just said, I'm not going. And everyone kept packing up the car. He's like, I'm not going. And he stomped his feet and he, you know, started screaming and yelling. That's fine. You don't have to go. Well, you guys can't go if I'm not going. You know, who's going to be there? Ha ha. And she said, neighbor's coming over. He's like, no, no, no. And he started, you know, getting really upset. And she said, you have a choice. You can calm down and go with us or the neighbor's coming are going to come over. I set up all your medicine. Everything's fine. We're going to miss you. But I know this is not about you. This is about Huntington's disease. And they did. They went. And he, the neighbor came over, and of course he calmed down because that's what people with Huntington's do. They're not going to you know, take it out on the neighbor who they kind of know but not so much. They had a great weekend. He was missed at this event, but they were able to go and they were able to have a good time, which is really important. So have that emergency plan. This way. All right, let's talk a little bit about kids' feelings and reactions. And this is very, these are just kind of different emotions that happen. Kids can start to feel sorry for themselves. Why is this happening to me? We talked about the children who are, who are narcissistic, not, not, you know, not as a personality, but it's about them. 
Kids might feel angry at the affected person for being sick. They might feel angry at the disease but take it out on the well parent. They might try to become super kid and set unrealistic high goals for themselves in school and at home. They might feel scared and be fearful that something will happen to the sick person when they're not there and want to stay there with them all the time. They might withdraw in order to become independent in case something happens to their parent. They might resent the fact that they need to take care of the affected person. They might be that jokester that makes jokes about everything to cover up their real feelings about HD. And some children will act out to get attention or might say that they do feel ill in order to stay with the affected person. So please do know children get sick. We know that. But I'm talking about those constant stomach aches, those constant headaches. That's a child who's not able to raise their hand and say, having anxiety over here, do you recognize it? This is what comes out. This is the types of physical things that happen to children and us at times. Um, but the child's not able to say, I need a timeout, or I need to talk to somebody, or I need medication, or I need you know, a, a support group. So it's really important to, to know that, of course, children get sick, but to be cognizant in terms of some of those types of psychosomatic issues that go on when they're having emotions. So what do we do? It is extremely important to continue to set firm limits with children. Limits does not mean you don't love them. And not having a curfew or not having them do anything doesn't mean you love them more. Children do need limits. They need boundaries. It is absolutely normal to see some acting out when there's changes in the family. Communicate with your children that you love and accept them, but not their behavior. I love you, but right now this is not okay. This is not how you should act. And reward good behavior and let them know how much you appreciate their help. Their help does not mean that they're going to start doing physical care for their parent. And I know that there are some families that it is, that's, that's all you have and that there's no resources. But in running the camps, I know that I've met children who have taken care of their parents since they were seven years old. And when I say taking care of their parents, I mean physically taking care. Reach out, please talk to somebody, let's see if we can get some resources in because that is really, really difficult. Sometimes a child will say, I want to do this. Well, you're seven or 13, and it's really, really difficult to know that that's not your role. So it's really important that the good behavior is, that, is something different. It's not that, you've, that they've done something that a, an adult should be doing. And set limits with the internet. Please, please, please. You know now, of course, about hdo.org. There is scary stuff for you and for children on the internet. Please do let them know. I know you're going to go on the internet. I'm letting you know that there's scary stuff out there. I'm letting you know that anybody can put anything on TikTok and internet, Instagram and everywhere, but that if you want information, there's a couple of really good sites. And sit down with them with HDO. Don't just say, but say, hey, I pulled up this website. Let's explore this a little bit. And you can go and you can have some time as well. Give them a little bit of privacy there as well, but do set limits. And share. Try to do things together as a family. Family is a very loose term. I have chosen family. There is some blood family who I don't want to spend any time with. I get it, and I don't have Huntington's in my family. So that's normal. Family means friends, chosen family, people who support us who are not toxic. That is really important to do. And laugh together. It is OK to do that. I have a family that says, laughter is our medicine. <coughs> They're on other medicine, too. But laughter is one of those pills that they take, they try to take every day. Make up inspirational slogans. One family says, one woman says, I've got a lot of living left to do. And post these things around the house. You know, it's needle pointed, it's on different places, it's on stickers that she made up. Share your stories and uplifting experiences. Children need to hear all of this, including the good stuff. When you create positive memories, you're teaching children that it's okay to have fun even when there is something sad going on. It's okay for you to have fun. It's okay for you to go out when that parent is still stuck at home. You didn't cause this. You didn't want this to happen. This was not your plan. But if you can show a child, I'm going to take care of myself, so I'm going to teach you how to take care of yourself as well, that is a gift that you're giving to them. And know that there is a small silver lining. Children in HD families can grow in their ability to face difficult experiences. They can become more self-confident and independent. I've seen this multiple times. Many times they become more responsible. And again, not responsible in a taking care of a parent way, but more responsible just in terms of their maturity. 
they can become more sensitive to others' needs. The children who grow up in these HD families are the first to go over to that person in a wheelchair in their classroom. They're not seeing that. They're not seeing a disabled person. They're seeing a person. And they might grow in their ability to understand and love another person, even if that person is different. And know that there are some resources here for you. Obviously, HDO. It's a wonderful website written by young people for young people. My book uh, is on um, Amazon um, Kindle, but you don't have to have a Kindle. So it's not in hard copy anymore. And I do apologize. I'm a one woman show that this is sort of um, too, too difficult to do. And I've sent it all over the world. Um, but it's called Talking to Kids About HD. And if you do go onto Amazon and go into the books, you can't do under all, but if you go under Amazon and books, it'll come up as an ebook. Um, HDSA, the Huntington's Disease Society of America, has the HDSA, Marianne was here, the uh, um, NYA, and there's a publication list, and you can go under that. And Huntington Society of Canada, the uh, HSC YPAD, also has uh, information. So those are just the smattering, and those are the ones in English. My book has been, I believe, translated into like five different languages. If that's helpful, you'd have to check with your, um, your, uh, your local agencies. Um, but if you don't have access to any of this, just come up. We'll try to figure out a way for you to get some resources. But just know that you're not alone and you have more tools in your toolbox. The fact that you're here and trying to uh, educate yourself is really the first step. You have not done anything wrong as parents. You now have another couple of tools in your toolbox, and hopefully you can use them. So I hope this was helpful for you guys. And if you have any questions, please do ask me now or come up to me later. So thank you. <laughs>